Hello there, everybody. Today, what I'm going to do is give you a description of the PC3 compact disc entitled Ad Astra 2, the second installment in the Ad Astra CD series. Okay. So I have the CD in my hand and I'm looking at it. And, and the very first thing that I see is the circle on the cover with the uh, island and the birds and the moon. And uh, it's probably one of my favorite covers that I've made because uh, the image on the front is actually a sticker that I got when I was a really little kid, probably in second grade or something like that. And uh, I love stickers. I mean, I, <laughs> I've kind of collected stickers my entire life. And uh, this sticker had survived like 30 years of moving and just, you know, storage. It was actually on a sheet of probably like six different stickers. I still have a couple of them, and this was one of them. So when I was putting together Ad Astra 2, I decided that I would load the image into Adobe and play around with it a little bit. And so I did. I knocked the sky out and I kind of, I kept the integrity of that original sticker, but I made it my own. I like the image a lot. I always have since I was little. So every time I look at the cover of Ad Astra 2, it makes me kind of smile a little bit, you know? So that's the, uh, the artwork on the front. So now when I take the booklet out of the CD jewel case, the first thing you see is the picture on the inside, and that's uh, a picture of the Quabbin Reservoir. It was taken at a place and a time in my life and in my marriage when things were kind of rough for the both of us. Um, in many, many ways, uh, it was a difficult, very difficult time, particularly um, financially. It was a rough time. And uh, my wife and I would go to the Quabbin Reservoir because it was free and uh, it was beautiful. And it's actually the water supply for the city of Boston. And uh, they have a pathway around the the reservoir that you can walk and we would walk it frequently it was just gorgeous and um and it was also kind of like an escape from the uh the turmoil that we were going through in our in our life um a lot of songs were written off of that vibe that i would get when my wife and i were there it was kind of like a magical place in that sense. It was a it was a little sliver of happiness, a little sliver of heaven in a in a very dark world. So when I see it now, it I go right back to that feeling. It's an instant reaction whenever I see that picture, and that's why I chose to put it on the inside booklet that goes all the way across the the uh, booklet. And it also is in line with the island theme. I guess I kind of, in a way, imagined that the viewer looking at the cover art would possibly assume that, that when you open the booklet, the island in the middle is the same island that's on the cover. It doesn't have palm trees, but I hoped that the viewer would get that connection. And I guess the Quabbin Reservoir was an island for us, in a way. And, uh, whoop. yeah, so that's the uh, booklet. The back side of the booklet is really not anything special, really. It's got the titles and the icon for Creative Commons attribution and for uh, my record label, my little Astra that I made that I described in the description for Clouds. Then you look at the CD disc face, and the disc face has the sticker, but just really big. It takes up the whole CD. 
And I thought that was cool because I got a chance to use that image again. And uh, when I look at the inside CD tray, uh, you know, you see the star chart. I guess if I'm going to describe this star chart, what I need to say is there are a handful of rock groups that I really, really like. I mean, I like a lot of music, but there's probably five that I really, really like. And I own everything they've made. Okay. Um, one of those groups is Enigma. I have everything he's made. And I think that he is uh, way ahead of the curve when it comes to making music and production. I personally feel he's the future of music. That's my opinion. The other group that I would list would be The Mission UK. Uh, another group that I own everything they've made, you know, I just, I love their music. And this star chart in the CD tray, truth be told, is really kind of a echo of Enigma and the Mission UK, but all in one image. And uh, I'm not sure it's very important that I even go into all this, but you know, for the sake of uh, explanation, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about it. Um, so you, you have this star chart thing, and the elements of this star chart are a pitch pipe, the notes in the sharps and flats of a pitch pipe, pipe choir, PC3, you know, little tip of the hat to that. And then on the inside of that, it's a, a concentric circles, uh, you have this cryptic kind of you know, series of letters that go around the uh, spindle. And what they actually say is the title of the album. So you have um, a little palm tree. If you look really close, you can see that I put a little palm tree right underneath the letter P, and that's where the name starts, or that's where this text starts. So it's PC3, Ad Astra, Volume 2. And the reason I spread those letters out like that is simply just reminiscent of this album by the Mission UK called Children. And on the front cover of that album, which is a phenomenal record, by the way, not everything on it is great, but the what is good is really good. Um, Anyway, on the cover, they, they did that. They broke the name up of the band on the front cover. And I always thought that was so cool how they did that. And so I decided to do the same thing on my CD because I'm allowed to do that. It's mine. I don't have to argue with anybody. I can do whatever I want. So I did. And that's that. That's the inside of the CD. Anyway, moving forward here. I had already done Ad Astra 1, so uh, I was pretty sure I was going to keep going with the Ad Astra Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. I'm a big proponent of uh, series kinds of things. And uh, it was probably, out of all of the PC3 albums, it was probably the easiest to put together. And in some ways, kind of a lot of fun. It was a chance to take some music from the past that I had. And uh, some of these songs are, you know, very far apart from each other time-wise. Like, they're not all recorded, you know, consecutively or anything like that. So it's kind of like a greatest hits to me. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to go into my catalog and really pick out the ones that I I wanted and uh, it was very clear you know there, there wasn't a lot of deliberation uh, making Ad Astra 2 it was a very easy process and it was very quick um, anyway so I'll talk about the music now a little bit the very first track on Ad Astra 2 is a piece of music called The Whisper. Very short piece of music. And the reason that it's so short 
is because of this. Okay, so where do I begin? I started to do home recording on a Tascam 4 track cassette recorder. It's what I started with. It kind of was my first introduction to recording at home. Um, training wheels, you know. And uh, so there came a point where I outgrew it and it was time to move up to the next level. And uh, so I did. I bought a Korg D1600 digital recorder and it was like a whole new world for me. Okay. But the day that I got it, okay, the, the very first thing I did was, you know, I opened the box, I unpackaged it, you know, I plugged it in, I plugged my keyboard in, and the very first thing I recorded was the whisper. And I recorded it as kind of like a test just to see uh, how it worked. And the net result <laughs> from just doing that test was good. <laughs> it was good enough to, you know, kick off a, a CD with. Um, so that's what you hear when you hear the whisper. It's literally the very first thing I did on this device that I would eventually go on to write, you know, hundreds of songs on. And um, it just changed my life. It was a whole new lease on life to be in the digital realm and to not have four tracks, but to have 16. Oh, it was fantastic. So that's The Whisper. It was the very first thing I did. I called the song The Whisper because I kind of felt that it was a whisper. <laughs> like it was a very quick, brief, quiet, simple thing. Now, you go to track number two, and track number two is entitled 2020 Vision. 2020 Vision is the first song I did uh, that was not an experiment. It was a, it was going to be the first long song I did. I sat down and I said, now I will write a song that's 20 minutes long. And that was a really big thing for me to do. It was not easy. Um, it was daunting, you know, this prospect of going up 20 minutes. It's a lot of music, a lot of ideas, you know. Um, I had released the song Try, and I talk about that in Ad Astra 1's description. So I won't go into it too much here. But um, when I released Try, it was the most successful song I had had up to that time. Uh, successful by my standards, which probably to anyone else is, you know, not much at all. But to me, I saw that there was a response to try. So it occurred to me that I could get away with doing music that was longer, and in fact, there was an audience for it. And uh, that gave me, you know, the green light to go ahead and sit down and try to make a song that was 20 minutes long, and I did. And that song is 2020 Vision. It was the first time I sat down and deliberately made a long 20 minute song, something I would eventually go on to do a lot and, you know, kind of surpassed even. But that was really what kind of kicked it off that whole idea of making these really long pieces of music. And, um,. I called it 2020 Vision because it, those two reasons that I can think of right away. Um, okay, well, there's the length of the song, which is 20 minutes. So 20, okay? Then I have the 2020 Vision, which to me means it was like a clear understanding that this is the direction I should go. It was uh, a path worth going down was very clear to me um, so I did and 2020 vision it was very clear 
Another reason that I called it 2020, I, I originally wanted to call it 220, just a number. I thought that was cool, but in the end, I opted not to do that. But the reason I wanted to was because when I was growing up, there was this street near where I grew up called West 220th Street. And uh, West 220 was kind of like a street that was very busy, had a lot of traffic. It was a main thoroughfare. And it was like where the big kids could go. And because I was a little guy, you know, I, I wasn't allowed to go there. You know, it was like forbidden. Um, because it was like too dangerous or something, you know. And then, of course, obviously, I got older and uh, 220 became a road that I traveled a lot uh, growing up. It was kind of central to my childhood in the sense that if I wanted to go to work, if I wanted to see my girlfriend, if I wanted to go to school, you have to go down 220 uh, to get to it. Everything was at the end of 220. And I guess I kind of wanted to pull some of that in to this song. So that's 2020 Vision. And um, I guess 2020 Vision is really a song about clarity to me. That's what, that's what I'm singing about. Um, it's got a really nice kind of vibe to it. But it's really me kind of talking to myself and reminding myself of you know where I come from and and uh, what my goals were um, as a musician what I've always tried to achieve as a musician so like remembering where I come from so that was track number two anyway track number three is called honest wave an honest wave is really important to me, and it's why I chose it to be number three on this CD. It's not a very long song. It's only about, yeah, it's only about six minutes long. And when I recorded it, it was just one of those ideas that I did one day, and I really liked it. Like, it, it came out really well. And uh, I tried to sing over it several times for probably for years. Every once in a while, I'd call up that session and I'd listen to the vocal that I had done, you know, months prior or sometimes even like a year ago or whatever. And it would be like not good. So I would re-sing, have like a new idea, try a new idea singing. And I just never could come up with anything that I liked. And uh, this was really before I did any real instrumental music, so uh, I just kind of shelved it. I never thought of releasing it because I considered it unfinished. And um, what's interesting about this story is that Okay, I told you I started with a four track and then I went from the four track to the D1600 16 track digital recorder. Um, my D1600 was a really great device. It had a lot of excellent editing capability and it was really great for me to get started uh, recording in, in the digital realm. It was really great for that. But it did have its problems. And one of the problems that that device had was this uh, inability to really back up any of the work that you did. The, the SCSI port on the back of it was junk and it was a, a pain in my you know what. Just was, it was not good. It was, it was a flawed design in that sense. And subsequently what would happen was a, you know, if something went wrong with this unit, like, and I have a tendency to overload. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I work a lot, I record a lot, so I would I would load this thing up with session after session, and I couldn't really back them up quick enough, so this the machine would get overloaded, 
and it would just sometimes just quit and it would be out of nowhere it would quit and I would lose everything I had on it and one time it quit and it didn't come back on so all of a sudden my life my career as a musician was over it was gone my machine died and it was just absolutely horrible so I I bought a new device it was time for a new one obviously and time to maybe step up to the next level so I got a digital recorder uh, 24 track a Tascam uh, Neo 24 track great device really good and somewhere down the line you know maybe a year or so after I got the new unit I managed to fix the D1600 so I took the time and the money to fix it and it got fixed and one of the first things I wanted to do was while I got it to work it wasn't working great but I got it to power up and I got it to function Um, I loaded in uh, an old session that I had backed up Honest Wave and I took the wave files from that session I I, uh, I copied the song out of the unit as wave files and I loaded them into my new unit my new task cam and that's Honest Wave so it was the first song rescue <laughs> it was you know up until the point that I had you know managed to fix my old unit that song was gone and it wasn't coming back so the fact that I was able to load it in and fix it and everything made me like so happy it was like this like hope you know that uh, I could do that and that not all the work I had done was lost um, so that's what honest wave is it was the first rescue from my old unit and I think I might have even tried to sing it again and it's like no this is just not working so I decided to release it as an instrumental and that's what I did that's track number three honest wave Um, and the title is one of those things again where I play with the words you know I love playing with the language and making up my own words even and in this case that's what I did I made uh, I made up the word honest wave O-N-I-S-T-W-A-V-E one word and I thought that was pretty cool I like the title I like that kind of thing I like the music I think it's a great little piece of music and it did really well for me so it earned its place on to Ad Astra 2 Okay, so that was track number three. Now track number four is a song called It Feels Good to Feel Good Again. And man, can I talk about this one. Of all the songs I have, really, this song in particular. Okay, wow. I have to start with this story. Uh... And the song is important enough for me to tell this story. It's it's worth the time to me. So my wife and I were living in a place and the place that we were living in was very happy and we loved it. I loved it. Uh, My recording studio was there. It was just fantastic. We were very comfortable. It was our home, but we were renting it and what happened was the owner of the house decided to sell so we had to move and we had no choice and i was heartsick it was horrible it was the it was one of the most difficult things uh, ever for me because uh, i didn't want to move i was happy where i was i loved where i was and uh, it was just really emotionally very hard to deal with even though uh, it was just the house it was just another thing it was like just for me in particular it was very hard and uh, 
This song was the song I was working on when we were actually leaving, when we were actually moving to the new place. And the new place wound up being better. It really did. But, I mean, much, much better. But uh, it was still, at the time, very emotionally difficult for me to do. And uh, so I started recording It Feels Good to Feel Good Again. And on the very last day, the very last thing I did, you know, before we literally left the house, was It Feels Good to Feel Good Again. I, st- you know, I worked on something. I stopped it. We moved. I went to the next place. I powered it up. And I started to work on it again. So that's... It was started in one place, in one location, uh, and it was finished in another. And uh, the reason I called it It Feels Good to Feel Good Again was because I was really kind of, I was consoling myself. Uh, This music was really the, really the first time that a song did that for me, okay? Uh, It really... Um, became more than just it was more than just music it was like medicine for me as I was recording it Um, all of the chord changes and the notes and every element of the song everything in it was put in the song because it made me feel good Okay, and this song got me through this very emotionally dark time for me. It was so, oof, so deep. It was deep. Yeah. And uh, I should have called it, It Would Feel Good to Feel Good Again. I actually considered calling it that. I say it. In the song, I just want to feel good again. I was dying inside. It was horrible. But I made it through and everything was fine. But whenever I listen to it now, oh, you know, it takes me right back to that feeling, you know? And it was rough. Cold world. Because people suck when it comes to money. Anyway, so that's It Feels Good to Feel Good Again. Track number four. So we go from track number four to track number five, which is a song called Snow Day. S N O D A Y, one word. Again, playing with the title. And Snow Day is a cool song to me because it was written a long time ago. The original version was written on the Tascam four track cassette. And I could probably play you a little bit of that right here. So that was Snow Day. And it was written uh, when I still lived in Ohio. And it was written on a day, uh, you know, like I've expressed in the other snowflakes, you know, my wife is an educator and she was back then. And when it snowed outside, she would have a day off of work. And at the time I worked outside. So when it snowed, I had a day off of work too. And it would snow really bad we'd have a day off and it was like this freedom these days of freedom where we just got to be home together and uh it was a sense of joy you know just to have a day you know a free day together and of course it was like a blizzard outside so we'd be all cozy inside and it was just a great feeling just an awesome day you know and um so I wrote the song on a snow day and I did it all at once. I didn't have to think about it too much. 
it came out really fast. Like I pressed play and record and I just did stream of consciousness kind of words and the music just came and it was done. And just like a snapshot of what I was doing that day. And I didn't really change it. I didn't go back and rewrite anything. I did, however, though, when I started to record digitally, I did redo the song. And that's what you hear on the CD. I thought that it was worth going back to it and and making it a nice, tidy, neat little, clean little recording. And that's Snow Day. And when I re-recorded it, I stayed true to the original. I didn't change a thing. I maybe sang it a little bit better or something, but um, I didn't change anything. That's what Snow Day is. It's like a snapshot of that joy that I felt every time we had a day off together back then. And I thought that was cool to remember that. You know, it fits into the remembering theme of Ad Astra 2. Short song, Snow Day. Very short, but poignant and clear. Remembering with clarity is what, you know, this album is about, I guess. Very clear memories. Pulling my past into the present. Not as a memory, but reliving it, you know. Then from there you go to the final track of the CD. It's a song called Remembering Past Everything. Um, There was a period of time back in, I want to say, early 2015. There was a group that I heard. They were called Low Roar. They released an album... And this album was so good. It was so well done. Uh, Very stark vocals and music and just very moody and uh, something that I connected with immediately as soon as I heard it. And I decided I wanted to do something similar to that. Okay, that same vibe, that same kind of feeling that I got from that album. And... uh, At the same time, um, I was experimenting with this idea um, of recording 24-hour songs. Not 24 hours long, but um, I wake up in the morning, I start recording. Whatever I finish around supper time is the song. I go back after supper and I edit, you know, whatever edits I need to make. And by the end of the day, I have a complete piece of music done. Remembering Past Everything is one of those. It was a song I started at five in the morning and by midnight I had it finished. And I liked that. I liked that process because normally I work on a piece of music usually about like two weeks. Well, depending on what it is. A lot of the time, it's about two weeks. But I, you know, I have worked on stuff that's gone way longer than that. Um, For instance, the In the Garden song I did, that took me an entire year to do. I mean, it was a year of working on that song. Um, My working on In the Garden probably had something to do with these 24-hour songs like wanting to be able to keep releasing new music, but I didn't have enough time to devote weeks to it, so it worked out pretty good. I make a song in 24 hours, I release it, and it would get snapped up, and people would use it. Great. And that's what Remembering Past Everything is. And that song, obviously, you know, the title, <laughs> the title says it pretty clearly, um, Remembering Past Everything. Now, since I wrote that song and since it was released, um, that song has really taken on a whole different kind of meaning to me. A while ago, before I wrote the song, we found out in my family that my sister had cancer. 
And one day in April of 2016, uh, I woke up in the morning and I just kind of decided to repost a couple of my songs on Facebook. And one of them was Remembering Past Everything. I wanted my family to hear it. I wanted my family to see it. Well, little did I know that that was the same day that my sister was going to pass away. So I released the song in the morning. Later that evening, my sister died kind of quickly and kind of unexpectedly. And since then, this song has kind of become like her song. When I hear it, I think about her. I think about when we were little and uh, how much I miss her and how much I love her. And just, you know, how sad I am that she's not around anymore. And so that's her song, Remembering Past Everything, for my sister, whom I love and whom I miss very much. So that's the the description of Ad Astra 2. Uh, An album of memories. Uh, A musical scrapbook of very important uh, music to me. And uh, it was a, a very fun process making the album and and fun to remember and to be clever with what songs were chosen to make the final cut so with that this is mike bostwick signing off for now and remember folks if you want to keep what you've got you've got to give it away take it easy